Solutions to the Dropout Crisis. Addressing the dropout crisis one strategy at a time. Brought to you by the National Dropout Prevention Center with support from Penn Foster and Catapult Learning and in partnership with Clemson Broadcast Productions. everyone and welcome once again to Solutions to the Dropout Crisis. Uh, we're here today with a really important program that I'm excited about sharing with you and sharing with my co-host Karen Whittington of the National Dropout Prevention Center. It's good to see you again Karen. Thank you Marty. I'm glad to be here. You know I know you're freshly back from San Antonio where the center has had its national conference and I got a sneak preview of it with that wonderful video you all have. And thanks, Marty, for saying something about that. Yes, we just got back from San Antonio. We had a terrific conference, our network annual network conference. Um, great participation, and if you were there or you missed it, you can still go on our website and see some videos and uh, photos from the conference and, and look over the program. Uh, Clemson Broadcast Productions did a terrific uh, little summary video that's really exciting. Yeah, and I could see you had an all-star cast, and the center always has all-star casts at their conferences, I've got to say, and there's some more coming up, as always. There's always more coming up. What's next? Right. The next one is another annual conference we do every year, and it will be uh, February 14th through 17th. 2016. That's our National At-Risk Youth Conference, and it's in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina. Every February we have it there, and it's a really good one. And so please come to that if you can. Registration is open now, and we're also taking calls. Uh, we have a call for proposals to present. To present, <laughs> yeah. So it's time, it's time, time if you've got it. a story to tell, right. opportunity to share it. And then after that, the next one coming up, and, and we're trying to have about five a year, so the very next one after the February conference will be March 6th through 9th, will be in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, for our Native American and Tribal Communities uh, Forum and conference and event. And um, it also is very um, an excellent opportunity for professional development. And, uh, concentrating on that population. Yeah, and I think it's great that we do concentrate on that population with a dropout situation in the Native communities really mm -hmm. needing uh, to focus on what works, right. and that's what you find out at the conference. Right. Well, um, I've got to say the topic today mm -hmm. is one that really interests me. Uh, a few years ago, we did a, um, a, one of these programs when we were on radio with uh, our NASA astronaut, and it was about STEM. And we got lots of questions about the arts and language arts and why you're not including that. Well, we got the answers today because <laughs> of our wonderful faculty here at Clemson University who Karen will introduce in just a moment. Um, you know, one of the things we provide here are resources, and I want to specifically talk to our uh, viewers who are Clemson TV because the viewers of the National Dropout Prevention Center website where we have the same broadcast going for both audiences, have this list of resources and a discussion board and all kinds of information that is helpful. And if you're on Clemson TV, you can go to that site, the National Dropout Prevention Center, and look under Solutions, and you will get the, uh, the same package. But right now, keep stay on Clemson TV, because we love to have you here, and, and the Dropout Prevention folks, we love to have you there. So there we are. Yeah. So yeah, there's that discussion board, but there's other very nifty ways um, uh, with the discussion board, the resources to supplement, but the conversation that right. we can have. Now, I defer to you, I could do discussion board, but as everybody at this table knows now, Marty is clueless about tweeting, and she learned about hashtags today. So it's like it's getting better. So tell tell our group here, I was watching, um, how they can communicate and discuss this important topic after the program. Right. Well, there is an extensive list of resources, too. Yes. And so go to the drop, yeah. uh, dropoutprevention.org. You'll find, I think there are almost 30 resources that mm -hmm. we posted related to the topic of today's program. But if you want to join in a conversation and be more on the edge and get yeah. some feedback from people all over the um, nation and uh, internationally as well, um, we've got a hashtag that you can use and we can kind of follow that uh, line of discussion and we can use hashtag STEAM. And our guests today have their Twitter accounts 
NDPCN is, has a Twitter account, and so, but uh, we can have a conversation through uh, the hashtag STEAM uh, mm -hmm. thread. Yeah, and we've got those, ha uh, those addresses up on the website, but we'll also put them up on the screen, perhaps when each one of you is talking. And I'm talking okay. right now to our guests, so I think, Karen, <laughs> because we're talking to our guests, we better introduce them and, and let them join in on this conversation. So I how about you doing to. that now? All right. Well, the, today's uh, program is on capacity building STEM, S-T-E-M, to STEAM, S-T-E-A-M, in South Carolina. And our guests today are um, working to expand an ecosystem of STEAM practitioners, policymakers, uh, sort of a network of people working in the area. I want to introduce um, Dr. Danny Harrow. She's an assistant professor of digital media and learning in the Eugene T. Moore School of Education at Clemson University. Mm -hmm. She's an Edmund W. Gordon MacArthur Foundation Fellow for 21st Century Learning and Assessment and an invited Playful Learning Fellow. Mm -hmm. She teaches about social media, games, and emerging technology. Her current research uh, is involves stealth assessment in games, efficacy of teacher professional development in integrating digital media into STEAM activities, and fostering computational thinking practices in adolescents. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank Welcome. You. Thank you. And our uh, other guest is Dr. Cassie Quigley, also from Clemson University's mm -hmm. Eugene T. Moore School of Education, and she's an assistant professor of science education. Um, her research focuses on broadening the conceptions of and participation in science, and that led to the interest in mm -hmm. STEAM. Um, you also teach, Dr. Quigley, the methods of science teaching. Yes, exactly. Yes. So you. glad to have both of you, Dr. Harrow, Dr. Quigley. Thank you. Great to have you on the show today and talking about STEAM with an A, yes. S-T-E-A-M. Right. It's nice to be here. Yeah, so let's get started. and. Um, learn about how we can incorporate the A to this STEM thing. Great. Um, yeah, so today, thank you for the introductions and for having us today. We're really excited to be here to share um, our work and, and some, some new things that are happening at Clemson and around the state. Um, you'll notice, I think you'll see the pictures, uh, our slide shows up now, but we have right. a picture of, um, we have a former student here teaching some students at the brand new Fisher Middle School in Greenville, South Carolina, and this is one of the first um, STEAM middle schools to be built um, with the idea of STEAM in mind. And actually, they just won a huge architecture award oh. for um, um, f nationwide um, in schools for really innovative architecture yeah. around learning. Um, and, and if you, if you mm -hmm. look at the picture more closely, you'll see mm -hmm. that the teacher has the students in a learning kind of a pod area outside of classrooms. And as they thought about building this school, they were very purposeful in that in each of these learning areas, you have a science teacher, a math teacher, a social studies teacher, and an English language arts teacher. And certainly they have related arts and um, computer technology electives mm -hmm. and, and video game courses and interesting things. But the space itself is really built to foster a lot of what we would see in STEAM um, learning, STEAM mm -hmm. practices. Yeah, I think you really have to start with that space thing because when you think about classrooms when I was teaching it was all in rows right. and in some places that the desks were screwed to the floor <laughs> <laughs> so there wasn't a whole lot of flexibility yeah, that's, that, that just changes everything mm -hmm. with what I just saw yeah absolutely and one of the things that we'll talk about today is about a lot about collaboration and, and you know being able to move the spaces definitely lends itself to collaboration yeah. but um, we're just gonna outline today we're just gonna talk about why STEAM is important particularly now so some of the challenges to STEM which you mm -hmm. kind of touched on that um, Marty Daniel will t walk us through some of those um, statistics and then what really is STEAM and then our current efforts so we have a lot of different projects going on um, mm -hmm. so we're going to talk through some of those and then some examples so what do we mean when we say this is in classrooms mm -hmm. and then you know let end with um, the impacts so we're really looking for a cradle to career approach so what does this mean for our students ultimately great okay. and so of course um, beyond teaching, we're both obviously researchers, and if we look at the current statistics, we're going to see a lot of statistics in STEM because STEAM is, is 
relatively new, right? So mm -hmm. there's some emerging data. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of examples of what STEAM might look like in classrooms, but, but very few empirical studies on STEAM learning. So mm -hmm. when we even thought about how what we needed to know to prepare teachers, we took a look at the statistic, statistics for yeah. STEM. And the first statistic even on this, on this page, you see that um, in 2014, so not that long yeah. ago, in the United States, we had 5.7 million openings in STEM fields and 4.4%, so about 4.4 million rather, required a bachelor's degree. Um, so, so there's certainly a need to prepare students mm -hmm. for STEM mm -hmm. learning. Mm -hmm. And then we have a very small percentage of U.S. citizens who are employed in STEM fields despite the growth in STEM education. So we've seen high schools and colleges and universities do a really nice job at trying to address STEM mm. education and graduate more students. But even as that's happened, as they've graduated more students, the students are often not choosing STEM careers. Instead, they're choosing careers that are really interesting to them that often involve arts and humanities. Mm -hmm. So they involve transdisciplinary or interdisciplinary ways of thinking, um, ways that they can be creative. So, so again, even though we're graduating some more, students in STEM fields are not necessarily choosing those jobs. We also know that we are um, grossly underpreparing women and underserved populations or minority populations for STEM sorts of jobs. Um, we have a changing demographic in schools. 43% of United States school-age children today are African American, Latino, or Native American. Um, yet, when we look at higher education, um, you know, graduation rates and those pursuing pursuing degrees, about 15% of um, African American, Latino, or black students choose STEM jobs. So we are trying to, with, with a, an idea, a process, a model of STEAM education, our, our goal is really twofold. Um, it's certainly to help fulfill you know, this, this need for scientists, mathematicians, engineers, mm -hmm. but it's also a, a process or a way of learning that will be engaging and will be hopefully very useful to all students who are living in a highly technological world who will, who will need a lot of the skills that STEAM teaching um, inculcates, mm -hmm. who will need to be creative and collaborative, who will need to use the arts and humanities as a way of um, sort of doing their daily work, um, either just functioning in society or through, you know, through employment. I mean, I'm wondering if you're saying, there's a couple things in my mind here. One is, you mentioned a lot of students did go through STEM programs, but did not choose to follow mm -hmm. that as a career because they obviously didn't meet, uh, didn't um, find it rewarding or interesting, mm -hmm. and that the missing element might be this creativity piece. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing I'm hearing is that at the front end, before they even go into this program, they don't, I would not be gravitating toward math mm -hmm. at all, right. period. Mm -hmm. But if you incorporate it in this mm -hmm. in different mm -hmm. contexts, right. it mm -hmm. would be part of the whole. That's that's the two ends. It's the beginning Absolutely. and the end that mm -hmm. and that obviously needs some help here. And the, the A is going to make that change, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah and that, that um, leads just um, exactly to what, what our next slide talks about. So what is what is STEAM? Mm -hmm. So yeah. what, what are we asking? We're asking that, um, you know, STEAM education pulls in, yeah. right, not only science, technology, engineering, and math, but also um, the A for arts and thinking really broadly about what that A means. Um, so not just the visual arts, right, beyond mm -hmm. aesthetics. Um, but also including the liberal arts, so English, social studies, humanities, right, are really important. And what's what's really interesting is, as Danny mentioned, the early research is telling us is that when students are exposed to STEAM education, it increases their motivation and engagement um, with and in those other fields. So mm -hmm. when it's approached through the arts, right, they start to see science looks a little different, that science mm -hmm. really can be very creative, that in math and problem solving there's more than one way to solve a problem, and so they become engaged in these um, more traditional subjects, which has been really interesting. You know, music is another one of the pieces, and um, there's a school up in Boston, Berkeley School of Music, whose friend's mm -hmm. son went there, and he's so into the digital, so they could dance mm -hmm. here with the digital expertise, that music, which you might not necessarily think of, along with the you know, engineering and science, is so much mm -hmm. now part of it. So th there's two um, left brain, right brain kind mm -hmm. of things that are going to yeah. happen here. Complement each other. Complement mm -hmm. each other. And, and I think music is another area that I was just thinking with Danny's expertise mm -hmm. in the digital. digital. 
Well, that's a way of reaching a lot of students today. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think you see, so in the DPA program, the Digital Production Program in the School of Computing or Engineering mm -hmm. and Computer Science, you do see um, students who are really engaged in what we would call STEAM learning. Mm -hmm. And so um, as they are producing, you know, whether it's pieces of film or mixing music or whatever mm -hmm. it is, or programming, they're usually working collaboratively. It's much more visual than what mm -hmm. we would have thought of in the past. And so again, if you think about students like that who, from what I understand, cannot wait to get into that program and yeah. do quite well and work with some pretty prestigious um, both film, movie, um, or documentary making um, companies or institutions mm -hmm. around the country have jobs almost immediately. It is because they're really drawn to those fields. Mm -hmm. And it, so it's a different way of even thinking about computer science or a STEM field. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have to, this, bring, I'll bring a lot of personal stories into this myself. But my daughter uh, didn't want to go near computers growing up. Her brothers mm -hmm. were so into it, so she had to be different, you know. But she ended up going into graphic design mm -hmm. and found out, because she's an artist, mm -hmm. she found that. That's how she had to do the design. Was mm -hmm. on it. So then she had a reason to learn it, and now she can do just fine. Mm -hmm. And she's used it for a lot of other things since. But it is the arts are a gateway, mm -hmm. really, mm -hmm. to learning this. And if we can see that early on with the children that you're working with and the teachers that you're working with who are working with those children, that, that we need to start that early. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, so what does this look like once you, you know, we're talking about in the K-12 setting. So mm. we, Danny and I have been working with, with teachers for the past few years. And really, this is about beginning with a problem to solve. So when you think about um, bridging all of these different disciplines, one way to do that is through problem solving. And so we work to create scenari scenarios that are ah. real world, um, that are authentic, um, that are relevant to the students' lives, that encourage multiple inquiry paths. So that means that the students could solve the problems using many different ways, right? And then bridging in those disciplines, mm -hmm. okay? Instead of starting with the content first, which typically happens, right? This starts with a problem scenario that they'll solve first okay. and then bridging in the content to do that. So this example that we have up here, I'm not gonna read it for you, but it's what it is is it's the students were asked to solve a problem, a real world problem. This is really happening in South Carolina is that sea turtles are um, you know, mm -hmm. reaching um, the, the point of, of close to extinction. Um, and, and even though they always sort of have these huge odds against them in terms of the birth, um, the birth rates, um, that their um, birth rates are now um, getting so low that they're even kind of confounding or confusing scientists. So, you know, their obstacles that they have, um, that they face are staggering, but what, there's some other things going on here. So, you know, they ask the students to solve this, help them solve this problem. And so this, this problem was actually um, brought to the school by a Greenville, um, a Greenville um, zookeeper, and she, um, you know, read the problem to them and said, "Look, this is this is what's going on. We have National Oceans Day coming up. We would love for for you all to help us solve this problem and then provide information to the public about this so that mm -hmm. they can learn from this and we can we can try to help these." these sea turtles survive. Um, and, you know, it becomes really locally relevant, right, being in South Carolina. Many students have the opportunity to visit the beach, and if they haven't have heard stories about sea turtles, um, also, um, you know, this was a, is or still going on a real problem, right? Um, when you think about solving this problem, it doesn't tell the students exactly how to solve the problem. They could go down many different paths. Some of the students looked at the migratory patterns of the sea turtles first and tried to figure out where did they actually go, right? And would there be some things that they're bumping up against to during that, that problem, right? Um, some of the students looked at some of the environmental impacts. Are there things that we're doing now at a higher rate? Um, the students quickly figured out that sea turtles eat jellyfish and jellyfish, um, Look, our plastic bags look a lot like jellyfish when they're floating. Oh. So some of them did some experiments with floating bags to show the public. Um, they, they almost look exactly like a jellyfish, particularly when you think about, um, you know, when you're underwater. Um, so they investigated lots of different issues that were going on then, and then they were able to choose how they disseminated this information in a wide variety of ways. So some of the kids did a more traditional um, pamphlet to pass out. Some of the students created a video game using Kodu, which is um, maybe a uh, Microsoft Research free download um, computer programming game mm -hmm. where you're creating a game and, and they incorporated oh, really? the elements that they were learning mm -hmm. about oh as they were doing their 
exploration and right. teaching other people how to play their game. Yeah, so the students, would, when they were playing the game, would, would learn about sea turtles during this process. Um, they also built a life-size um, um, sea turtle um, in their art class. They named him Gary, the sea turtle, because they thought Gary was a slow <laughs> name, so we apologize <laughs> to any Garys out there. <laughs> but um, decorating... Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So snail. they... Um, <laughs> They decorated it with um, plastic bags. They wove plastic bags um, to to bring that information, and then um, that was actually um, displayed at the Greenville Zoo, um, so that oh. they could they could see. Um, and and what was re was really interesting is that you know the students were engaged in many different ways, but then sharing that information um, through, throughout. So this is one example of a problem that you know we've done, and we've done lots of different scenarios with um, students and, and teachers. Yeah, that sounds that sounds like an awful lot of fun, mm -hmm. which is what we want education to be. Because then everybody, you don't have to worry about motivation; mm -hmm. we're just having fun. Tell me the roles that you said the teachers work collaboratively. Mm -hmm. I'd like to kind of drill down and find out. Yeah. Wouldn't you like to know mm -hmm. what the teachers did? Yeah. yeah. So when yeah, so when you when the question always comes up, so where's the content in here, right? Where mm -hmm. are the standards that are aligned? So some of the standards that were required. This was in a um, sixth grade class. Um, so sixth grade science standards are about ocean currents. Okay, so in science they were learning about those pathways, those ocean currents. So the teacher might do a mini lesson for all of the students on these ocean currents if they didn't investigate it on their own. So and do some assessments based on that. Um, another science standard is the human impacts on the environment. So what are we doing, right? Um, so they did some some. Um, lessons on um, what can be recycled, how can it be recycled, what, how are we doing this at a higher rate now. Um, in math, they did some things with proportions um, and um, looking at these rates and how these rates have changed over the years. So is this really so staggering or is this pretty normal, right? And what they discovered is, yeah, it's, it, you know, the, the sea turtles are not surviving at a much higher rate. So they tried to figure out the, that proportion and the percentage change. They also did some really neat things in math class with the sea turtles on um, why is it so hard for them to survive? And they did some investigations into um, the actual size of the sea turtle, how big it has to get. You know, most sea turtles can live to be about 100 years old. Um, so they did some investigations of the size of their shell, the weight, different things like that. Um, <clears throat> actually, in social studies, they did some things um, with studying um, Native American populations and their connection to um, sea turtles along the coast. Um, so we used to have a, a much larger Native um, American population, but so they connected to that, and there are some um, ceremonies and some different things um, that was connected that way. Um, in the arts class, besides building Gary the sea turtle, what they did is, that, you know, that they have just a fabulous art teacher here at, Fish, at their Fisher Middle School, and she really wanted to move beyond, you know, just the design element of art, mm -hmm. but art as expression. Mm -hmm. And so she had the students create migratory reliefs, which um, um, a, an art relief is, um, you sort of see the stacked paper where it gets, um, starts out bigger and gets smaller and smaller and mm -hmm. smaller. And so she had them do um, the sea turtle's path on the migratory uh, of the migration. And then she had them talk about their own migration. So it might be when they moved to middle school, what was that migration looking like? Did they ever have to move? Did they have to change churches or, um, you know, those sorts of things. And so the students got really creative with their own migration. And um, then she had them write an artist statement afterwards talking about how all species migrate, right? And sort of made these connections between mm -hmm. the sea turtles migration and their own migration. So really sort of moving beyond just the design element, but really towards a, a very abstract um, concept, which was great. Is this curriculum available? To, uh, is, did they just make this up, or is it? I mean, yeah. So we'll, yeah, we'll talk more okay. about that as okay. we work with yeah. teachers. There are a number of different scenarios that teachers use, mm -hmm. linked to both content that they have to cover, certainly capacity and standards, mm -hmm. requisite skills, and all right. of that. But that is the goal of STEAM education. So teachers get comfortable creating these really engaging scenarios. And so we are actually finishing building out a STEM website in the School of Ed that's linked to the larger um, STEM initiative on Clemson's campus mm -hmm. that we're calling the STEAM Collective. And we will have a teacher resource page mm 
um, that will be one of the, the final pages mm -hmm. that we still are kind of okay. uploading things. And that should be live in the next few weeks, I would Great. guess. Mm -hmm. And yeah, probably found through the School of Education's yes. main yes. site. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We'll what, have to link to that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and one of the things that we um, you know, are just so impressed with whenever we work with teachers is how creative they are. Mm -hmm. And so once they sort of you know, work um, through what, how, do, how does this work, and then getting them to pull in and, and create these scenarios themselves, they, that really engages them as well. Um, and they're well, teaching. Well, they, I mean, they know the standards they have to teach, and they see mm -hmm. these students doing these things, and they can then take what's already going on and students are engaged in and see the connection to what they have to teach. That's what I heard you saying. Yeah, absolutely. That, they, that the students were doing this, and they said, well, I have to teach that, and mm -hmm. this matches up, and maybe I have a gap I need to fill. Absolutely. So I can fill mm -hmm. that with a little mm -hmm. lesson for everybody. Mm -hmm. But... Um, it's making teach fun again. Yeah, and absolutely. some of the teachers have reflected on that. Yeah. And again, and we'll talk a bit about how we prepare yeah. teachers because mm -hmm. it is, it, teachers, as Cassie said, are really creative and very motivated, yes. but it certainly is a process. Mm -hmm. and yeah. they, they go through the process first as a student, mm -hmm. and then they kind of turn around and okay. what will I do as a, a yeah. teacher? And it's, and it's bound to result eventually in some real world solutions to absolutely. some of these yes. real That's problems right. because absolutely. I can imagine Years later, the students are still thinking about mm -hmm. that problem because it's a real problem. That's right. Yeah. And so, and here's another scenario. I'll spend a little, mm -hmm. little less time on this. And so, this is a scenario that uh, Cassie and I have have created recently. And, and again, what happens as we work with teachers is then they turn around and they create a unit plan, a STEAM plan, where they create their own scenarios. So um, in this scenario, again, it's geared really for um, upper middle school, maybe ninth grade students. Mm -hmm. And if you take a look at just the wording, again, if we talk about making it interesting or relevant to kids, a 15-year-old student, Trevor, um, taken mm -hmm. to an emergency room, Mary Black Hospital, obviously, is a local hospital. Um, and mm -hmm. you're, he's, th this particular young man has all sorts of symptoms, and the students need to really figure out what's going on. Mm -hmm. So they take Take on the role, and in a number of the scenarios, whether it's stated or implied, students have a role when they're solving these problems. So in this case, and you don't see the entire scenario, they are working um, for the Center for Disease Control, okay. and they have to um, provide a solution after collecting data, um, taking a close look at what the problem is that they're supposed to solve, and then they present it to the Secretary of Health and Human Development. And again, as Cassie said before, they go down a, a number of paths. Now, they won't really present it to the <laughs> Secretary of Health and Human Development, mm -hmm. but somebody would simulate, um, likely simulate that, that mm -hmm. role. Mm -hmm. um, in many cases, however, we do have students present to people who have these jobs in the real world, yes. or we yeah. connect them with mentors, and we'll talk a bit more about that. Mm -hmm. But even the idea that we're talking about 15-year-olds, vacation, um, mosquito-borne illnesses, mm -hmm. disease, or potential epidemics, high interest to students. Yeah. And there is a way that we can um, teach the content that we need to teach, math, science, whatever it might be through a problem like this. Mm -hmm. So you just get a sense that there are a lot of different ways that you can go mm -hmm. with scenarios. Mm -hmm. and, and again, teachers get really good at this once, once we kind of work with them a bit. Mm -hmm. And so we, we wanted to talk just a bit about some of our current efforts. Okay. Um, and one of the things that we've done recently um, is a faculty in residence at Fisher Middle School. Mm -hmm. And again, we chose Fisher because, or maybe Fisher chose us, we already had had this partnership with them as the school was being mm -hmm. built. And there were a lot of people in the School of Education who were kind of laying that groundwork. And as they opened last year, I did the first semester as a faculty and resident um, as you know, digital media and learning expertise. And yeah. then Cassie went in second semester as a science educator. And for us, it was a really nice contextualized way to do two things. Mm -hmm. To um, first of all, help, fa uh, help staff if that's what they needed and also yeah. learn what does this look like? What does it look like, mm -hmm. this use of space? Um, the teachers had already had some professional development towards STEAM. What's missing, if anything? Um, you know, um, what might we do moving forward? And so they were really, really gracious and generous and really letting mm -hmm. us into their classrooms mm -hmm. and then letting us propose based on our expertise or what the emerging research said, what might be a good idea. Um, and then we are, we're continuing that faculty and residence um, with a secondary literacy professor 
this semester. Okay. And then next semester, a professor of arts and creativity. Oh, there we go. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. so that has been a, a, again a really nice place for us to kind of see what these practices look like. Mm -hmm. um, so, is it because it's a new school? They've slowly been building the team of faculty in residence, exactly. and so mm -hmm. you, you remain there. It's not just like you're there for one semester. You're there. No, no, no. We're there for a semester. Yeah, yeah. We're, yeah, you're right. Yeah, and then and then mm -hmm. it, it keeps adding to be four of you there at the same time? Is that what you're saying? Um, there's usually yeah. one of us at a time, yeah. and mm -hmm. then we just sort of, we rotate, we go through, and I, I am next year, either Cassie or I will be back, or it may be a different oh, professor. See. So there's mm -hmm. always somebody available. But as you know, once you sort of build a relationship with, yeah, with teachers, I, um, so we still work very closely with the, with the teachers. We're in and out of the school. Um, you, you know, quite a bit, um, and have a great relationship with with the principal as well. So. This has got to be a great way um, to be a teacher educator uh, than in the days of old when so the nice. teacher educators had been teachers at one point thirty years ago, mm -hmm. and probably yeah, didn't spend absolutely. too much time in school since. Mm -hmm. And so now you're just right there, and mm -hmm. I, I know it must be a, an incredible experience. Yeah, I think it really is a really nice collaboration because. Yeah. Um, you know, we are, are able to stay um, current with what's happening in schools, right? Mm -hmm. um, but also, you know, they get the benefit of we, we have the more of the time, right, to help them design some of these projects and, and, and work with them. So I, I think it's been a really nice collaboration. Yeah. And, and also to work through the challenges. So, mm -hmm. what, you know, so you can do some phenomenal professional development or coursework or graduate yeah. courses in ideal settings. Mm -hmm. Not that Fisher isn't close to ideal in terms mm -hmm. of the structure, yeah. but, but yeah. still the reality of mm -hmm. students and diversity and bus schedules and teaching to bells, even if they're longer mm -hmm. blocks. Mm -hmm. so, so again, that's been very helpful. And I, I imagine also, because you have students in regular classes too, mm -hmm. that they're getting the benefit of your experience there too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, who are the, yeah. the ones who are not at the mm -hmm. teachers there. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Yeah, yeah. cool. Yeah. Yeah, so mm -hmm. the, um, the next, one of our next major projects is really working with educating teachers. So as Danny said, this is a mind shift for mm -hmm. teachers um, who may have been, um, you know, really forced to sort of teach to the content and to the standards and of yeah. course to the test. Um, and so what we're asking them to do is sort of just rethink some of the way that they're teaching. So that takes a little training as, as you might imagine. So we've mm -hmm. been working with this, we're on our second cohort of teachers. We're, we work um, particularly in middle schools, um, but um, so helping them to see um, what this looks like. So we begin by them acting as students, working through a real world problem themselves, uh -huh. um, spending really um, three or four long days, um, you know, sort of eight to five, re really digging in and investigating. And we've done a couple, set up a couple of different sc scenarios. One we did um, locally, the Reedy River, sort of looking at some of the water quality issues and um, issues of, um, you know, um, overpopulation and things, you know, that we might need to investigate. The second one that we just did p this past summer is that the Greenville News, and this is actually true, is being imploded um, because they don't need this massive structure anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and so they're building a um, sort of high rise for Greenville um, building with um, a movie theater and a high end restaurant and hotel. Mm -hmm. And so what are some of the things that that um, might come up when you're changing um, the landscape. So we had this, the teachers investigate land remediation, right? Mm -hmm. So if this was an old, um, you know, newspaper mm -hmm. processing, you know, what, what might, what are some of the concerns, right? Mm -hmm. um, then thinking about it from a marketing standpoint, right? So how would Greenville like to approach this? Also increase in population, you know, we're starting to see this huge population boom in downtown Greenville. What does that mean when you're bringing in all these other people in terms of parking, those sorts of mm -hmm. things, lands, landscape architecture, those sorts of, all those sorts of pieces. And so the, the, the teachers really um, spent three or four days investigating this and presenting it. And then we transitioned them into, okay, so you got to go through this as a student. Mm -hmm. Now let's think about this from a teacher standpoint and then help them design their units. Yeah. Um, so really over the course of the summer, you know, they come out with, um, some lessons and unit plans that they can, um, you know, then implement in their middle school classrooms. Yes, yeah, so they're really they're experiencing the process that mm -hmm. they're going to then um, support with their own students. That's right, and in, in some cases, the frustration, which seems to always disappear by the third day, and yeah. and sometimes the frustration is in collaborative work. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Not that they aren't incredibly friendly towards one another, but but how do you take a task mm -hmm. that is. Uh, a problem that that has more than one solution, and mm -hmm. in, in this case too, we did see them going down 
multiple lines of inquiry. They were asking new questions, which is exactly what we want them to have their students do. Yeah. 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 So, mm -hmm. it's, it's yeah. Valuable. Mm -hmm. So, of course, you know, as that we're moving the, this into schools, one of the things that um, is really important is, is, is supporting the teachers during this process. And so we've developed a couple different um, observation tools that um, we're using with um, okay. the teachers. So the first one is called SCALE, and it's a STEAM classroom assessment of learning experiences. And so what teachers really want is, you know, to know, am I doing this right? So when we mm -hmm. go in and we observe them, you know, we needed an observation tool to say, you're doing this really well, you need some work on this. So we've developed this observation a protocol that we've been using um, as we observe them that focuses on those teaching practices. So are they using inquiry-based? Is it a problem-based approach? Is this relevant to the students' lives, right? And then, you know, throughout that process, you know, are they assessing their students throughout so they know whether or not, mm -hmm. you know, they're actually learning the material? And so we work with that. And that's been a really helpful tool for our teachers to be able to say, okay, I see how, mm -hmm. you know, I at this point I'm really sort of reverted back to my traditional teaching, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and help and really help, help support them you know, in this process, because this isn't something that they can learn once and then, you know, perfect, but over time yeah. with our support and with the support of their school district and, and um, principals, you know, be able to um, really implement well. Uh, and the other piece, co-measure, is something that really came from teachers saying after the first cohort, which was, mm -hmm. and these were Bosch-funded mm -hmm. initiatives, so Bosch actually graciously mm -hmm. paid for mm -hmm. nice. 40 we have 43, 44 mm -hmm. teachers over a couple of years, maybe 45 mm -hmm. teachers to go through this process with us. But after the first cohort, the teachers were saying when we'd go to their classrooms, feeling really comfortable with a lot of the STEAM teaching practices, even mm -hmm. though we were helping, you know, continuing to work through them. Mm -hmm. But how do I know if my students are doing group work or really collaborating? Yeah. So um, we are working through or working on a tool that will be teacher friendly. So this is just a screenshot of it. And we're working with research affiliates from um, Crest, a research lab in Los Angeles and the Educational Testing Service, where um, they are using evidence centered design, which of course is much richer than um, performance data where it's, you know, multiple choice or student reporting mm -hmm. or whatever. So what we've been trying to do is come up with indicators. What does it look like? What does student collaboration look like when students are working in STEAM activities or units? So we've taken a lot of video data. We've looked at um, what PISA has to say, some of the international standards mm -hmm. um, that, are, that are starting to take a look at, again, measuring collaboration. But how is it specific to STEAM mm -hmm. and students working in STEAM groups at the individual level? So we have about five different indicators right now that we've identified, and this will be something that will be teacher-friendly, where they can say that the student is really at the needs work acceptable or proficient range um, when they're collaborating. And, and hopefully, again, over the course of time, if you have schools that are having students working in STEAM activities in middle school three years in a row or late elementary school and through middle, this will almost become second nature. That this is how I pick out if I've mm -hmm. set up the um, problem mm -hmm. or the scenario in a manner that students can collaborate and that this is where the individual students are when they're working through this collaborative process. What would those five indicators be? So I don't know if I can remember them all, but inquiry rich. You'll remember four. That's always the way. If there's five, you'll remember four. <laughs> so so w one of them is inquiry rich or multiple paths. Um, some of it is student. Uh, one, another one is student directed learning, although we're tweaking the name a bit. Mm -hmm. But how are they directing their yeah. learning without the teacher necessarily mm -hmm. stepping in and relying on peers? Another one is just how they behave in a group in terms mm -hmm. of respect and being what we would call collegial at you know mm -hmm. this, this student yeah. level. Mm -hmm. um, what were the other two indicators you remember? Yeah, so positive communication was the one yep. with respect. Um, yeah, we may have to think about it. We'll we think can, about that. Yeah. But mm -hmm. the, the thing um, is, do, do uh, let's say we have, well, the four of us could be on a team. Oh, okay. I remembered one. Yeah, I oh, what's that? That? What is it? A transdisciplinary thinking. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. Well, and that's what I'm wondering. And, and like, the, I'm not the mathematician. <laughs> Karen's oh, Karen take care of that. You could take care of the computer stuff, mm -hmm. and you're going to take care of the science stuff. And I'll take care of the art stuff. How am I going to know? Mm, you know Marty is doing yeah. the digital stuff and and, and learning the science, mm -hmm. and you know right. she's contributing. And are we stretching her? Or are we this keeping so her important. in a silo? Right. Mm -hmm. So so we just talked about yeah. that, and some yeah. of that is definitely in the way that the teacher sets the problem up, and uh -huh. I'm going to say assigns the roles that are not the old roles of recorder yeah. or presenter yes. or whatever. Yeah. And so that you see that the t the students rather 
together have been able to through, through the course of the year take on different roles yeah. in their collaborative in their in their mm -hmm. teaming or group work. Mm -hmm. And the other area was really the tools that they're choosing, whether they're digital or non-digital. Uh -huh. Do they mimic authentic tools? So in collaborative problem solving, mm -hmm. you would expect students to be able to choose the appropriate tools. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So again, even though a lot of this is certainly modeled by the teacher and the teacher access yeah. facilitator, you want the student to be able to make these decisions where it becomes almost second nature after years of yeah. practice. Yeah. And what's so important about this, and this is what we hear over and over again and what yeah. you were alluding to is, um, you know, whenever we hear the word collaboration, it's often become synonymous with group work, mm -hmm. which exactly. tends to be one student doing all the work and then right. the rest sort of sitting back or, you know, um, just not equitable distribution mm -hmm. of work. And so this tool is really going to be helpful for teaching those collaborative skills. So we've identified these five areas mm -hmm. and even sort of drilled it down to what are some things like when you're if, if you're not communicating in a positive way, right, and you sort of, you know, mm -hmm. name call or do those sorts of things and it shuts down that process, yeah. how can a teacher redirect that right, mm -hmm. to get them back mm -hmm. in a productive collaborative space? And so it will not only be used as an assessment tool, but hopefully eventually as a way to help you know, yes. identify some weaknesses mm -hmm. that, yeah. that the students are struggling with and then as a teaching tool. So it might be at times that, you know, teachers will assign roles and then it might be at a time where, you know what, they've sort of moved beyond mm -hmm. that and mm -hmm. now they can choose their own roles, right? Yeah. And then you might rely on your expertise, right? Or right, you might right. try something different. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Well, it's going to be a very helpful process, yeah. I think. You mentioned that teach, you're working with teachers in the summer some. Are you working on some kind of STEAM certification, anything like that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. so um, the Clemson University Board of Trustees just approved our STEAM, STEAM certificate um, and during their October meeting. And that this is a four-course sequence um, that focuses on project-based learning, digital media and learning, and then reflective practice, which is that implement, mm -hmm. implementation time, and then, of course, assessment. So these four courses are going to be available for teachers. Now, Danny and I focused mainly on middle school teachers, but we have colleagues in elementary and in um, secondary and high school who um, are also interested in, in teaching in this certification. And so teachers will be able to take this four-course sequence really between the summer and online options mm -hmm. so that make it really um, user-friendly for them and when they have the time of available to that. Um, the next stage is that it's moving to the South Carolina Department of Education um, um, level, um, and then we hope to really be able to offer this eventually, um, you know, outside of South Carolina. So that's some of our some terrific. of our goals. Mm -hmm. Well, it's terrific to be breaking new ground and providing uh, the tools that teachers yeah. need um, to be able to implement this in a, in a way that's going to be more powerful and meaningful and, and achieve the goals that you know mm -hmm. it can reach if it just can be done the best way. Mm -hmm. and we're going to be in full of good intentions, but if we don't do it properly, we don't get Absolutely. the outcomes mm -hmm. that we're mm -hmm. looking for. So this is exciting, mm -hmm. and we'll have to keep our eyes on this, that's for sure. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. and this helps to validate the, the teacher's work too. Yeah, you know, when they, um, you know, learn these new practices, so this is really a change for them. And mm -hmm. you know, the the, the certifi certificate requires a lot of their time. So, yeah. by being able to say that they have the STEAM certificate really helps to validate their work. Now, so. and, and, and I'm looking at this is when you're taking that course, like this project-based learning. Does that mean, therefore, part of your work or your homework or whatever mm -hmm. as a teacher will be to do a project? in your class and mm -hmm. following Definitely. that procedure. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's doing that, yeah, very absolutely. experiential then with yeah. your own students. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Real but, world problem. And with that, yeah. is that an online kind of thing it would be? But, well, mm -hmm. right now we have project-based learning and digital media and learning, and those aren't the exact course titles. We've yeah. simplified them a bit. Mm -hmm. um, we offer those at the same time so yeah. that they have the skills that they need to enact a project in the classroom. Mm -hmm. Um, then the reflective practice course happens during the course of the academic year, and that is primarily online. Okay. Um, we do go into classrooms and work mm -hmm. with teachers, but they do a lot with discussion boards, mm -hmm. with videoing one another, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. with conversations back and forth. We have just two face-to-face -face meetings. And the assessment course we are just developing, so we've been offering before the certification mm -hmm. the first three courses, and the assessment course will likely also be an online course. So mm -hmm. um, in all likelihood, the first two courses will be offered Face to face, face or a face. combination, and the, mm -hmm. the last two, most of them will be yeah. online. So, is this the na first, the nation's first? It's the nation's first okay. certification, mm -hmm. STEAM, STEAM certification, uh -huh. yes. Oh, wow. That is. 
quite impressive. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and, and, and very common sense. It makes a lot of sense to to teach in yeah, that way. Yeah, absolutely. And I will say our t the teachers that we've been working with, you know, really have enjoyed this, um, despite some of the, the challenges that initially, um, mm -hmm. when they get into the classroom and they see certain things happen immediately, one thing is a ga engagement. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as we know, when students are engaged, they're much mm -hmm more likely or less likely to misbehave, right? Mm -hmm. Classroom management almost becomes non-existent, right? Sort of having to manage the students. Um, so that engagement piece really hooks the teachers into, yes. um, you know, continuing this work. Um, you know, we've heard teachers say things, you know, that they've been teaching for 30 years and this reminds them of, of how they used to be able to teach. And so mm -hmm. that, you know, because it's still connected to the standards, it's still um, about the content, right? right? So how, sort of helping them um, develop that pathway that they love teaching in, which is really, yeah, you know, always. really great for us to see. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so. Well, I think people around the country are going to want to contact you, too. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> and so I don't know the best route for that, Karen. You're the guru around that. But certainly the discussion board, uh, right. the email address for the center, mm -hmm. and then we have the the at, uh, the at addresses for these. Right. Yeah, they, I and I'm sure your yeah. emails and all are in yeah. the Eugene T. Moore yep. School yep. of Education uh, mm -hmm. directory and can find you and, uh, yeah. and uh, contact you that way. Yeah. And we've posted on this yep. uh, Solution show your mm -hmm. Twitter mm -hmm. handles, find you then. and yeah. you can always <laughs> contact the Dropout Prevention Center. Yes, and uh, we'll mm -hmm. we'll find you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, it's been it's been great. Yeah. So this impact then. Um, what any final thoughts here? I see that there's one more slide, and yeah. and we were interested in that impact yes. of all this. And, and I think uh, one of the biggest take takeaways for both Cassie and I and the teachers that we're working with is that this does reach students that likely would not have been reached through traditional mm -hmm. ways of thinking about STEM. Mm -hmm. Not that that's not very important, it is. Mm -hmm. I mean, the STEM work that's been done has been good work, but it, this, this really resonates with a completely different group of students and doesn't seem to alienate yeah. or leave out students who would have mm -hmm. already been served by STEM mm -hmm. education. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, you know, one of the things is just these skills. So instead of focusing so much on the content, mm -hmm. it's about these skills, which is really important for our students today because like in all likelihood, you know, the jobs that they will be um, you know, going into, uh, we, we don't even know what those are, but yeah. we can certainly teach them things like creativity and collaboration and um, problem, solving. problem solving, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Inquiry based mm -hmm. approaches. So all of those skills will, will certainly help, help them in their fields. Well, I think these actual experiential kinds of things really reaches the students at risk mm -hmm. who um, find memorizing facts about science yeah, or math or whatever mm -hmm. is something that is like, why do I need to learn this? That's you know, right. it's just like, I'm, I'm out of here. And for a test, and, I don't care about. Mm -hmm. but and the art and creativity uh, element of that also reaches the students at yeah, risk who yeah. tune out. It mm -hmm. just gets to of be course, yeah. something that they're not being able to create yeah, anything absolutely. around. So if they can see that connection, yeah, mm -hmm. I think. Connecting, between, connecting these dots is really mm -hmm. important, and that's such a way to, re to reach these students who, as you said, have, have been kind of left out and, mm -hmm. and, and could contribute so much because they're so creative. And, Absolutely. And, and they've, they've got all the tools, too. They just need us to help facilitate them bringing those tools together. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. So we're hoping this will make a big difference in our state. Mm -hmm. And now it looks like maybe with a good role model of how to do it to states beyond. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Do you have any final thoughts? I don't think so. I think yeah. we've covered a yeah. lot of what, what we would have wanted you. people to know. Yeah, thank yeah. you so much for having thank us. Well, this yeah. is good. Do appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you both yeah. for being here. This yeah. is a, a great, and it's trending. I think mean, <laughs> we're trending on this with an A and adding in the T. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is definitely the way to go. And, and I think about that program several years ago that there was this, there was a yearning for this to happen and to actually put it in a format where it can be part of a teacher education program mm -hmm. is. Um, post or pre mm -hmm. that's my final question is how about the undergrads oh, are they that's a great that's, question uh -huh. let's think about them too because yeah, um, we've got to prepare them so we don't have to play catch up mm -hmm. so I, I teach courses on 
digital media and learning. As a matter of fact, it's foundations mm -hmm. of digital media and learning. And in my courses, I model all of this. So the students actually do some work with STEAM mm -hmm. units. They solve problems around the Clemson campus, making yeah. the campus a walkable campus. Mm -hmm. A lot of collaborative work. Yeah. Um, we talk about how this aligns with computational thinking. It's pretty closely aligned, where you take a problem and break it down and mm -hmm. take out the parts that aren't needed yeah. and then propose solutions and abstract yeah. it. So, th so the crossover. Yeah. So we are working really hard to integrate that in courses in every um, pre-service teacher takes foundations of digital media and learning, mm -hmm. and I know Cassie does a lot with STEM. Yeah, so I teach, like, um, I prepare future science teachers, and so um, I, it's very similar, um, infuse a lot of this into those those methods, as well as some of our students have the opportunity to become um, student teachers and are working at Fisher Middle School, so right yeah. now we have a couple in there, and so when they also see it at work there, and then we also have them matched with some of their mm -hmm. other our other STEAM teachers um, so that they really see it enacted, which of course makes makes all the difference. And, and I will get excited when the language arts teachers and the people who are teaching social studies and history yeah. are all integrated into Absolutely. this process as well. Yeah. We'll know mm -hmm. we're there when, when yeah. all of us are Everybody's there together. Everybody's invigorated. And everybody's yeah. invigorated. So this has been fun yeah, because it's, um, it's the kind of teaching that resonates here. Mm -hmm. Oh, I used to have to do that with a microphone. <laughs> <laughs> we are, we're getting so high tech here. But thank you both thank you for you joining for us. us. Yeah. It was really good it's to great. have you here yeah. and find out the new things that Clemson University is taking the lead on. That's exciting for us here mm -hmm. at, at Clemson to hear that and the National Dropout Prevention it Center. Is. Yeah. It is. So here we go. It's time to um, say goodbye until next month. And we'll be looking forward to seeing you all here at 3.30. And, uh, That'll be in December, golly, almost Christmas. But the <laughs> second Tuesday of every month, 3.30, we have Solutions to the Dropout Crisis, so we'll have another wonderful program for you all then. But thanks for viewing, and we'll look forward to seeing you next time. <laughs>